We're going to be taking a short break from the book of Romans, and this week and next, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. You can open up your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and this week and next, we're going to be covering verses 19 through 31. This morning, we're going to look at verses 19 through 25. What we're going to see is what it looks like to embrace Jesus as your high priest. That's what we're going to see this morning from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. We're going to see what it looks like to embrace Jesus as your high priest. And then next week when we're together, we're going to see the implications of not embracing Jesus as your high priest. What you believe is most clearly demonstrated, what you truly believe is most clearly demonstrated by how you live. I could say that I'm a painter, but unless I paint, there should be no confidence or very little confidence in that declaration. I personally should have no confidence in that declaration unless I actually paint. Simply declaring something does not make it a reality. It may actually be true, but the greatest indicator of what we actually believe or what is actually true is how we actually live. This is never more true and never more consequential than in regards to what we believe about God, than in regards to what we believe about Jesus, and particularly this morning in regards to what we believe about the priestly ministry of Jesus. And we know that the gospel message is a message of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. It is a message of hope and newness of life and purpose. God takes one who is spiritually dead at enmity with him, the the one who is suppressing truth about him in unrighteousness, one who is godless, one who is helpless, a sinner. And God makes that one spiritually alive no longer under sin's reign and bondage, that one has newness of life in a very real way that is to manifest itself no longer in self-worship, but worship of God through living for him. You see, every moment lived after conversion should be lived in an increasing level of obedience to God out of love for God. The entrance into the household of God is one of grace and mercy. And as you are brought into that household, it is also one of obedience and submission and yielding yourself to the Lord. This morning, we're parachuting into a critical turn in the book of Hebrews, a critical transition. Verse 19 begins with the word, therefore. And this is very similar to the transition that we saw Paul make recently in the book of Romans, recently in chapter 12, right? We saw 11 chapters of rich theological truth about the gospel, and then therefore, in light of this truth, here's how you live. One who embraces these truths will live in accordance to them. It will produce things in them by these truths, by the mercy of God, which Paul had just set forth in the book, live this way now. Well, the author of Hebrews is doing something very similar in our passage this morning. We see a transition. We see a a summary of the priestly ministry of Christ. And then we see instruction for how to live in light of that. So let's look together at Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Like I said, this morning, we're going to go through verse 25. Starting in verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another on 
to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Well, the author of Hebrews in verse 19 says, therefore, since. And he summarizes really the book of Hebrews thus far, but particularly the priestly ministry of Jesus upon which hinges the gospel. Since this priestly ministry of Jesus, and then he gives three commands. He says, therefore, since Jesus has done this work, then what does it look like for you? What must it look like for you? And he launches into three imperatives, three instructions or three responses that one who is embracing this truth must follow. Just for a moment, look at verse 22. The command there is, let us draw near. And then verse 23, the command is, let us hold fast. Verse 24, and let us consider. Three commands that hinge on this reality, this summary that he is giving. Now, before we look into those commands, those appropriate responses, we need to spend some time on this review that the author gives of verses 19 through 21 of the priestly ministry of Jesus. Look down at verse 19 again. He says, therefore, brethren. Then he says, since or because we have confidence to enter the holy place. And this is where he starts in his summary, a confidence to enter the holy place. This confidence means a boldness. We have a boldness. Since we have a confidence or a boldness, particularly this word is used in reference to a boldness of speech. This idea here of boldness of speech is a, a letting your guard down. It's the idea of not being on edge. It's where you're not walking on eggshells. He says, since we have that kind of boldness to enter the holy place. Now, we're going to take... We're not gonna take the time to trace out everything that has been taught in the book of Hebrews thus far regarding the holy place, but in chapter nine, verses one through chapter 10, verses 18, the author has made it clear. He's made it crystal clear that the holy place he is referring to is not the temple in Jerusalem. That was a mirror of the actual holy place of God. And the holy place the author is referring to here is the original holy place. It is the dwelling place of God in heaven. The holy place is not in Jerusalem. It is where God actually dwells in the heavens. It is where God resides, not a structure made by men. And just ponder this. Just consider this for a moment. Jesus is the only one who can get you access to God personally. Personally. His priestly ministry is completely unique. The author's original audience consisted primarily of Jews who were familiar with the holy place of the tabernacle, which represented God's presence and how only the high priest could enter into this place and only once a year and not with confidence, but with fear and trepidation, hoping he did everything right because he was entering into the sanctuary, the holy place before God. But here the author is saying, Jesus has made a way through his blood, for you to come with confidence or with this boldness. And every believer possesses this, should possess this, to enter into the very presence of God. And by what? By what do we have this confidence? Look at the end of verse 19. By the blood of Jesus. Believer, your ability to have access to come before God is only through Jesus. Jesus is not only the priest on behalf of those who are saved, but he is the priestly sacrifice which has been offered that grants us access to the very real presence of God. 
It was himself, it was by his blood offered up. And the only sacrifice that could grant us this kind of confidence is the perfect holy sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if our confidence is founded upon our merit, did we do enough? Did did I tip the scales with my good deeds? If that's the basis of our confidence, we would be filled with utter trepidation to come before God and rightly so. But when we understand the sufficiency of the blood of Christ, that this is a new and a living way he has made through his flesh as the great high priest, we can come before the presence of God with confidence, with boldness, because it isn't founded in a self-confidence. It's not a confidence that's rooted out of looking within. I did all these things, therefore I have a right to this. I have earned this. I have merited this. It's not that kind of confidence or assurance, but it's rather founded upon a faith in the sufficiency of the priestly ministry of Jesus. It's a confidence that says Christ, the Holy One, the Messiah, his sacrifice was pleasing and acceptable and adequate. He has made a way where there was no way. Our access, Christian, your access to God is exclusively through Jesus. That is the message of scripture. There is one way to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. And the confidence, the only way someone can have confidence to draw near to God, to be near to God, to enter into his presence is one who has been washed by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20, the author of Hebrews says, this is by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. This is explaining how the blood of Jesus gives us access to God. This is a new way. It's a way we were unaware of before. It wasn't there before, but now it is there. It is a new access. It is a living way. It's not a list of rules to follow. It is living because it is a person This new way is a living way, and it is Jesus. This new way Jesus made through the veil that is his flesh. The veil in the temple symbolized a separation between men and God. Only the high priest could enter once a year after shedding the blood of animals, yet Jesus' flesh being torn, his blood being shed, allows every believer access to God permanently through him. This is a new and living way, and it is Jesus. You know that salvation has always been by faith. Romans was very clear as we looked to Abraham. And yet Christ, the Messiah's coming, the Christ's death on the cross, has brought this new living way before us as we see before us the priestly ministry of Jesus. That's really been the theme of the book, that we can have confidence because of Christ. Verse 21, the final verse of this recap, says, since we have confidence before God, and then 21, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, since these things, this is the message of the gospel, this is the message of Hebrews, that's really been the theme of the book, creating a way for us through Jesus, that Jesus is the great high priest. Ever since chapter three, we've seen this, Jesus not only provided a way, but he is the one who is near to us in that way. The high priest would come before God on behalf of God's people, and we see in chapter seven, Jesus lives to make intercession on our behalf. Turn just to the left a little bit. I want you to see this in chapter seven. The unique ministry of Jesus as high priest. We'll start in verse 23. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death 
from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. What great news. What great news. Verse 25, therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. You can turn back to chapter 10. So when the author here tells us that since we have confidence and, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, these realities would have been cutting they would have been astonishing. They would have been overwhelming. How amazing, how awesome Jesus is. We have a high priest who lives to make intercession forever. Forever. What a hope. What a comfort. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus has made a way for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has offered the perfect and only sacrifice for sin. The author of Hebrews has demonstrated the work of Jesus and that he alone is the only way. And he has been presenting the superiority of Christ in a detailed explanation of the gospel. Now, because of this, therefore, what does it look like to fully embrace these realities of Jesus as high priest? What should pour out of one who has yielded their life to Jesus? What does new life in Jesus look like? As we hear, as we accept the truth about Jesus, we may even have had our emotions stirred by the truth. If this indeed has taken root in our heart, if this is real about you, how should that manifest itself outwardly? What will it produce? And then the author of Hebrews sets forth wonderful details and instruction for us after summarizing these wonderful details about the ministry and work of Jesus. Here's how you must respond. If Christ is your high priest, this is your obligation before him. This is a necessity. It is your joy. It is the outflow of what it means for Christ to be your high priest. These are critical responses to the reality of the gospel and negligence to these commands or disobedience to these commands would demonstrate an inconsistency between one who confesses belief in Jesus and what belief in him actually must produce, what it does produce. At least it would reveal areas of our heart where we are not believing things about the ministry of Jesus on our behalf and responding appropriately in light of them. So, what do we see here? What do we see in our passage? What we see is that the priestly ministry of Jesus, summarized in the verses that we just looked, like, looked at, must produce three responses. The priestly ministry of Jesus must produce three responses. The author of Hebrews sets forth three commands that must flow out of the one who has been saved by the work of Jesus, one who has looked to Jesus as their only means of reconciliation and fellowship with God, should walk in obedience to these instructions. If Christ is your personal high priest, if you have placed your faith in the gospel, if you have repented from a life of self-worship, self-adoration and humbled yourself before God, trusting in Jesus' sacrifice alone, how should that look? What should be on your heart? What should be on your mind? What should be your priorities in this life for the glory of God? 
What does it mean for Christ to be your high priest? Number one, the priestly ministry of Jesus must first produce this, a drawing near to God. A drawing near to God. The priestly ministry of Jesus must produce a drawing near to God. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near to command with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Draw near. This command would be incomprehensible completely unattainable without Jesus. Considering our sinfulness, considering God's holiness, the command for the sinner to draw near to God, it is a jarring command. If this doesn't create a little bit of stiffness in your back, wait, wait, what? You're not fully comprehending the reality of your own sinfulness, the reality of God's holiness, the reality of what your sin deserves before the holiness of God. And yet we are instructed here in light of the priestly ministry of Jesus, draw near. Draw near. A Christianity that looks to Jesus for salvation but doesn't want to be near to God is not a biblical Christianity. A Christianity that wants the benefits of salvation in the relinquishing of condemnation, but does not want fellowship with God, is not a biblical Christianity. The command for the sinner to draw near to God is jarring, and yet because of Jesus, we can. The author is telling us to draw near to God. This command would be terrifying if it wasn't for the reality of the priesthood of Jesus. We can have confidence to come before God. We can have boldness to draw near with full assurance of faith, and we can have full assurance of faith because of our confidence, which is in Jesus. We can draw near. We can come boldly before the throne of grace to the very presence of God. We can draw near to him coming into his very presence. And and we don't draw near as his counselors, but we draw near to find help in our time of need. So we come to him in prayerful dependence and in faith. Turn to the left to chapter four. Chapter 4, verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Verse 16 tells us to draw near with confidence that we might find grace in the time of need. And it's, it's, a clear, it's clear here, this is a, a plea for help from God in chapter four. And we can have confidence to draw near in prayer to God, to approach him, to request of him aid. We aren't coming to God to get him to do what we want. We're coming to God in humility. We're asking, we're pleading with him to help us be what he wants. We come with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. He will help. He will hear. He will draw near to you as you draw near to him. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And all of this is because of Jesus because of Jesus. Here we see first in this instruction that a critical practice of the believer who has Jesus as their high priest is prayer. And we have access to God through prayer. Prayer is to be the lifeblood of the Christian. 
It's a duty, it's an obligation, it's a command to draw near to God. Prayer is a duty of the believer, but it's not a a burdensome duty. It is a gift made possible by the blood of Jesus. When was the last time you contemplated the reality that in prayer, you are able to approach the creator of all things, the one who spoke all things into existence. When have you last contemplated the reality that in prayer, you are coming before the most powerful being in all existence, the most holy, the most majestic, the most wise, the one who is sovereign over all and rules all in perfect power, and yet you sinned against this God. You were an enemy of him. You sought to suppress the truth about his greatness in your own unrighteousness. And yet you were reconciled to him, not by your own doing, but by the blood of Jesus. And now you can commune with him. You can fellowship with him. You can request from him help. You can worship him. You have access to him. Thinking about the duty of prayer, when was the last time you thought about it that way? Prayer is not a burden that's required of you that must be fit into your life. Prayer is an immense privilege that has been made possible through the blood of Christ so that you can have fellowship with God. And we're called to do it. We're called to draw near to God. Have you considered the reality that you can come now boldly into his presence and pray to him, petition of him for, the, for things, hopefully for his glory? The author goes on to say, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Prior to Christ, our conscience condemns us. Knowing our guilt and that guilt remains until the sin is removed. And yet Christ's sacrifice has cleansed us from a guilt-ridden, evil conscience. Every sin, every uh, offensive declaration, every moment of doubt, every moment of anger, every moment of selfishness, every impurity, every action that we have done that is an offense to God, every thought that we have had that is wicked and evil before us in our conscience should condemn us before a holy God. Does. And yet his blood has cleansed us. The weight of that, that each one of us should rightly feel apart from Christ, has been cleansed. We can have confidence to come before God, to draw near to God, not on the basis of our righteousness, but because we know that God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, in him. And then the last phrase you see in verse 22, having our bodies washed with pure water. Do you see that there? Back in chapter 10. This is referring to Baptism, but particularly what baptism symbolizes. We know that one is not saved by the physical 
baptism, but it is an outward display of what Christ has done inwardly, like 1 Peter 3.21 says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt, and Peter brings clarification from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've been washed before God. Christ's blood has done spiritually what baptism symbolizes to make us anew, to wash us clean. Our conscience no longer condemns us. We are cleansed. Positionally, before the Lord, we are found righteous, not on our own merit, but on Christ. And Christian, you must draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance, knowing this reality. Believer, when you're tempted to think that your sin condemns you, that you don't have access to God, we are to remember these realities. We must draw near. It is our Christian duty and our privilege to get to do so. We draw near with faith. We draw near with trust in God. First, the priestly ministry of Jesus must produce a drawing near to God. Secondly, the priestly work of Jesus, the priestly ministry of Jesus, must produce, number two, a holding fast the confession. Holding fast the confession. That's the second imperative, which is the appropriate response to the priestly ministry of Jesus, that we hold fast the confession. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We are to hold fast to something. We're to hold fast the confession of our hope. The author has already spoken about our confession in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. That's chapter 3, verse 1. The confession of our hope here is a summary of our Christian faith in Jesus. And as chapter 3, 1 says, Christ is the apostle or the sent one and is the high priest of our confession. Thus we hold fast to the truth of what God promised to accomplish and what God did accomplish through Christ. We are to hold fast to Christian doctrine the crux of the, the Christian faith, what he has summarized in verses 19 through 21, what the book of Hebrews has taught regarding Jesus, the person of Jesus and his ministry, we are to hold fast to these things. This hope that we have in the reality of who Jesus is and what God has done through him and what he has promised through him, we are to hold fast to this. What does it mean to hold fast? It's to adhere to, it's to, to hold firmly to, it's keeping a white knuckle grip on this, like a new teenage driver holding the steering wheel. We are to hold on to this hope of our confession. We must cling to these things. We must cling to Christ. We must cling to his priesthood, his intercession, and the promises of the new covenant. All these truths are held out as our hope. In 1022, he's saying, draw near to God, picturing intimacy with God and coming into his very presence by faith. And now he moves to hope and holding firm to the truth that's been communicating, communicated regarding Jesus. Draw near with confidence in faith and hold firmly to the confession of our hope. Prior to salvation, we were dead in our transgressions and sin and our trespasses without God, without hope in this world. Now, because of Christ, because of the rich truth, we know we have hope. The message of the gospel is a message of hope. Have you ever felt hopeless? Maybe this morning you feel hopeless. Maybe you're in despair. Your soul is downcast. You don't have to remain there. You don't have to remain there. Embrace the truth that you've heard about Jesus. Entrust yourself to him. 
There is hope in him. This message is a message of hope. It, it brings hope to us. We have a confidence that what God has revealed and what God has done is true and good and right. We are to hold fast to the confession, these realities of who Jesus is, where our hope is found. How important is doctrine? The author of Hebrews has just put forth rich, detailed, specific explanations of the person of Jesus, the exclusivity of Jesus as the way to God, the intricacies and details of the gospel. And in response to one who is entrusting themselves to the priestly ministry of Jesus, to one who is a believer in Jesus Christ, you are to draw near to God and you are to hold fast this truth. How important is it that your view of Jesus is the right view? Don't compromise. Cling to Christ in the midst of a hostile world, in a world that elevates an idea of acceptance and unity at the expense of a defined spiritual truth. Don't compromise. Hold fast to your confession, the hope that you have. Don't let go of that in your heart. Don't think it doesn't matter. Don't elevate other things as more important than the truth that God has revealed is the only means of reconciliation and eternal salvation before a holy God. In a world that promotes so-called virtuous things over biblical truth, hold fast because that is your hope. If you have a distorted view of Jesus, you have a compromised view of Jesus, so you, in your heart, do not let go of these realities of who Jesus is as your high priest, as the perfect substitute. Do not let go of this. Assume a continual position of humble submission under God's word. What God has said is true about you and sin, about salvation, about himself. Humble yourself under this. Know this. Don't let it go. Why? Why must we do this? Why can we do this? You see it there? Because he who promised is faithful. The end of verse 23. You can trust God. He is, he is faithful. Our confidence is once again founded upon he who is faithful. We can have a certain confidence of the future of what it means for Christ to be your high priest, which plays out in submission to him. This may seem obvious, yet what does it look like practically to hold fast to the confession of your hope, to not let it go? What about when persecution comes and you're called to proclaim things that aren't true about God? You're called to forsake your faith. You're called to reject Christ. What about when you're mistreated? Will you hold fast to what God has said is right and true? What about when you're unjustly accused Will you hold fast to the confession of your hope? Will you believe that fidelity to Christ is more important than self-preservation, self-justification? What about when you're anxious about tomorrow? Will you believe that what Christ has accomplished is sufficient? What about when you're tempted to go back to your old way of life, walking in sin? What about when you're tempted to doubt the trustworthiness of God? What about when you're tempted to think your good works adds to what Jesus has accomplished? 
or when you're tempted to think that a moment of disobedience undoes what Christ has done for you. Hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering. In faith, believe in the faithfulness of God and hold firm to the truth of our Christian faith. First, the priestly ministry of Jesus must produce a drawing near to God. Secondly, the priestly ministry of Jesus must produce a holding fast, the confession. And then lastly, this morning, the priestly ministry of Jesus must produce a consideration of one another. A consideration of one another. Look at verses 24 and 25. The command there is, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And he explains what that looks like. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Verse 24, we see the third command here to let us consider. This is a command that has to do with the mind. This is a command to be considering, to be thoughtful, to be intentional in your thoughts about one another about how to stimulate or how to provoke others. The instruction here is to give brain power, give thoughtful contemplation as to how to stimulate each other to love and good deeds. Does this seem out of place as we're making our way through this to you? Does it seem out of place? It's not in the mind of God. You see, a right understanding of the priestly ministry, a right understanding of the gospel, gospel is followed by a command to draw near to God, to hold fast to the truth, and to give intentional thoughtfulness as to how to help others love and walk in good deeds. Does your connection to others in the body make love easier for them? more attainable for them. It seems far easier to contemplate all the ways others are not loving us well. The command here is to contemplate how to serve others, how to stimulate others. One of the key implications of the gospel is a, de- is a death of self, and this is manifested by a thoughtful consideration, not of ourselves and what we want and what our preferences are, and what we like and what we tend to lean towards or what we expect or what we think we deserve, but rather of how we can help others love, how we can make obedience to Christ easier and more attainable for one another. And the author gives a starting point in verse 25 by not forsaking or assembling together. The starting point to this consideration of one another is being connected to one another. This is what is to flow out of one who is truly believing that Christ is their great high priest. That one draws near to God in faith, fixes their heart, and doesn't let go of the hope of their confession. And this person considers how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. How do I consider others? It starts with not forsaking the assembly as is the habit of some. Do you see that there? Being with other believers is a necessary obligation of the believer in response to God. It's a worshipful act of obedience to join together. And this demonstrates some things. It's critical for believers to assemble together. You got to be there. You've got to speak truth. You have to confront. You have to be confronted. Have you ever had the thought, man, it's so much easier to be a Christian when I'm just by myself? This isn't God's intention. Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. How do you do this? First, it requires a physical presence in the assembly. Don't forsake this. Don't deprioritize being together. There are reasonable reasons to not be here. There are reasonable reasons why someone who loves the church and loves the people of God and is connected with people of God may not be able to be here. 
But don't forsake, don't abandon, don't elevate other things in priority over your participation in the body of Christ. Maybe consider this question. What is your heart's disposition to the challenges that come into your life that make it hard to be connected towards with each other? Do you run towards excuses to not be here? To not be at small group? To not engage in fellowship with others? To not participate in ministries within the church designed to enhance obedience to this? Or or do you push through the obstacles with vigor where you can to be here whenever you can? In fact, have you given thought in career choices and commitments to make sure that you enable yourself to be obedient to this command? There should be a deliberate, intentional pursuit of obedience to being together. This is a crucial part of the Christian faith. I know of those who participate in our assembly and have to spend five days after physically recovering. But every chance they can, they're they're here, and they're loving. They're serving. They're spurring us on. You can't say I'm a lover of God and I worship Jesus Christ and forsake the assembly. It's an inconsistency. It, it is either total hypocrisy or you're in a season of disobedience. You, you can't say that faithfully. I love God, I love Jesus, but it's just between me and him and I don't love the people of God. First John 4, 20 says, if someone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now listen, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir You're here. (laughs) Praise God for that. I'm sure there are some here who really need to hear this, though. That's how God works. But, But Grace Bible Church, beloved, you serve. You are faithful here. You make it easy to love. You create enthusiasm to walk in obedience and holiness of life. So grateful for you. And yet it is a helpful reminder, a good encouragement to excel still more. Does your thoughtful connection to this body enhance others' ability to please the Lord? It starts with, being there, but there is also a deliberate consideration as to spurring or provoking each other to love and good deeds. There must be a thoughtful consideration as to how to provoke to love and good deeds. How do you think about the church? Do you find yourself thinking about what others aren't doing or what they should do more of more than you spend time considering how you can care for others? Do you find yourself complaining in your heart or maybe even out loud about the church, about others in the church? Do you have a propensity towards complaining about everything the church isn't or doesn't do as opposed to embracing God's call to be here with an intentional purpose of encouragement towards love and good deeds? Do you lay down your preferences for the love of others? What would make it easier for those around me to love? What would make it easier for others to do good deeds, to walk in obedience? Do I hold grudges in my heart? Do I forgive? Do I distance myself from others? Do I hold on to unbiblical expectations of others? Do I make it difficult for others to be around me, to confront me, to encourage me? This is the mandated response to one who has been saved by the work of Jesus. We're to do this. Look at verse 25. All the more as you see the day drawing near. Christ's coming. 
He's coming. We're to be faithful in this. We're to be zealous in this. We're to be heavenly minded in this. We're to be deliberate in this. This is not a, an instruction of labor. This is a, a gift of a command. A life lived this way, a life lived in nearness to God, a life lived holding on to the hope that is found in God, a life lived consumed with serving, serving others and not fixated on self is so much better as a life lived in worship of God and fellowship with God. It is so much better than anything else. And this life is made possible through Jesus, his great work, his priestly ministry. Praise God for Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have in him. We thank you for the confidence that we can now have because it is found in someone outside of ourself. It is found in Christ. That we can have fellowship with you, that we can worship you. Lord, I pray that as we contemplate and consider the greatness of the ministry of Jesus and what he has done for all who are his, I pray that we would respond in obedience in a way that demonstrates true faith in this reality. I pray that we would embrace who Christ is, that we would submit ourselves to the truth of what you have said about us and our need and all that you have accomplished through your son. Pray that we would be eager to walk in obedience to these things, that we would be intentional to live this way, to draw near to you, to hold fast to your truth, to consider others, all so that Jesus would be seen as the, the great Savior that he is, so that you would be glorified as the great God that you are. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.